Oh. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first ever virtual field trip to Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Sorry for the little del technical delay there, but uh, I think we got it all worked out now. Uh, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory is the Department of Energy's national lab at Stanford University, so we're excited to give you a chance to see what we do here today briefly. Uh, my name's Andy Freeberg. Oh, yeah, I have a lower third. Let me turn that on. Oh, no. Um, I am from Slack's Office of Communications, um, and uh, we have a couple schools here with us today. Uh, let's uh, say hello to them quickly before we move on. So out in Jeffersonville, Indiana, we have uh, Jeffersonville High School. Hi, guys. Oh, hold on. I got you here. I got you. Okay, there you are. Yeah. Now say hi. 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 <laughs> All right. And over in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, we have Mr. Labdell's class at uh, Journey School. Hi there, guys. Oh, hold on. There you are. Okay. Hi. Woo. All right. <laughs> All right. I also wanted to say hello to um, our different uh, scientists here quickly. Uh, we have three different scientists who are in three different parts of Slack right now. Um, they're each going to talk to you a little bit about what they do, but we'll just say hi quick first. So uh, over at our accelerator, we have uh, Spencer Gessner. Hey, Spencer. Hi, Andy. Hi, everyone. Uh, and then over at our X-ray laser, we have Kat Graves. Hi, Kat. Hi, everybody. And then over in our Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope uh, Science Operations Center is Andrea Elbert. Uh, too many microphones for me to turn on and off here. Oh, there you are. Oh, you're on. Hey. Hi, Andrea. Hey. Welcome to Slack. All right. Um, OK. So before we get started, I wanted to say a couple things about Slack, just uh, who we are. So Slack is one of 17 Department of Energy National Labs. Uh, we are one of 10 within the Department of Energy's Office of Science. Uh, we are at Stanford University, just a couple miles uh, away from the main campus. Um, and Slack, it used to stand for the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Um, but like a lot of companies uh, these days, uh, we dropped the acronym at, one, at some point, and we became Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. And that was because uh, kind of the same way MTV doesn't play that much music anymore, um, we do more than just linear accelerators. So you're going to see our linear accelerator to hear about it. It's very cool. Um, but we also do a lot of other things these days. Uh, and uh, we also can add then the National Laboratory name. Uh, Slack, if, you, if I wanted to explain it really quickly or really briefly, the uh, main thing I would say is that we do really big science experiments, the sort of science experiments that uh, you couldn't just do at a university, you couldn't just do at a company you need to have a, a lot of people and a lot of um, infrastructure and, and projects put together. So we run those kinds of things looking for uh, really creative ways to test theories of physics, chemistry, and biology um, at really the margins of what humans understand about the world. So at the biggest scales of supernovas and galaxies, uh, and then at the smallest scales of uh, individual molecules and atoms. Um, and at the highest energies and to the highest precision ever uh, possible. So those are the kind of things we do. In the, in the government, they call it uh, basic research, which I think is kind of a funny term because um, it's really, there's, the stuff I know about it, it does not seem very basic. It's, it's a very complicated, complex stuff, but it's really just understanding um, fundamental science uh, uh, and learning new things about the natural world. We have about 1,700 people on staff here that support that, and then we also have about 3,000 researchers who come in to Slack uh, every year to do research, whether that's to um, run an experiment or work with our researchers uh, or something else like that. So that's one of the big things we do is have people come in and do research here as well. When Slack first started uh, 50 years ago, we had one of the first particle colliders, uh, and we really were the center for particle physics. But over the last 50 years, uh, there's been huge changes in technology, and uh, 
And uh, particle physics has become a really huge international effort. Uh, and so now we really collaborate with people and uh, do a lot of work all over the world. Um, we don't have a particle collider here anymore. That's a common misconception. Our last collider closed in 2008. Uh, but we do work a lot with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Uh, and we use our accelerators to do other things, which you're going to hear about. And we still do a lot of particle physics, which you're also going to hear about. Um, the other thing, I think just one more quick anecdote that's kind of, I think, illustrates that point of big collaborations in doing science is that uh, Slack was the first uh, place outside of Europe to have a website. So our physicists were working with Tim Berners-Lee at CERN, and so they brought the World Wide Web over to Slack as a way to share information about physics. Um, and so here we are doing this field trip through a website. So I think it's kind of a cool uh, way to look at um, how this kind of research it really can have a huge impact. All right, so with that, let's get uh, going. And I thought a cool way to start the field trip would be to kind of bring you guys here using a different Google technology. We're on Google Plus right now. So I thought I would use uh, Google Maps to kind of bring you guys over here. So let me do that quick here. I'm going to switch over. And you should see there's a, the whole country. And I put little markers. So here's Journey School, or sorry, Journey School in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and Jeffersonville High School uh, over here. I know there's a lot of other people watching all over the country. I, I wanted to give actually a specific shout out to uh, Bristol Eastern High School and Bristol, Connecticut, who are also watching. So that's probably somewhere up over here, right? Uh, and then over here we have Slack. So let's uh, bring you into Slack. And as we start to zoom in, hopefully it won't lag too much, you can see the Bay Area. This is San Francisco up here. Uh, and down south is Silicon Valley. And as you start to get close, uh, pretty soon you're going to see where Slack is. Uh, so you probably see a very long straight line here. That is the Kleisron Gallery, which is where our first scientist is. He, uh, this is the longest building in the world. It's a two-mile long particle accelerator. Just so you know, this is, uh, this is Stanford's main campus over here. Uh, and then Slack actually is the accelerator, plus all this kind of stuff over here. So um, that gives you a little sense of where we are. And now we're going to go to Spencer Gessner, who is in the particle accelerator. Accelerators are very central to everything we do. Um, and he is going to uh, tell us a little bit about what we do with particle accelerators. Hey, Spencer. Hi, Andy. Hi, everyone. So uh, as Andy mentioned, I'm standing in the Claystron Gallery. That's the building that houses all of the important equipment that makes the accelerator run. Uh, if you look over my shoulder, you can see that this building is super long. You can't even see the end. It kind of just vanishes in a point of light. Um, every year at Slack, we have a race to see who can be the first physicist to run all the way down and all the way back on the accelerator. It takes about half an hour, and then you can really appreciate how long this machine is, because when you're out of breath, and you're struggling. You're like, why is this so long? I wish this thing was much, much shorter. Anyway, it's the longest accelerator in the world. It's the highest energy linear accelerator in the world. And what we do here is we produce really high energy electrons. The main goal of the accelerator right now is to produce these electrons or something called a free electron laser. Um, but as Andy mentioned, we used to do lots of particle collisions. We'd accelerate electrons and positrons, all with this one device, which we call a LINAC, a linear accelerator or a LINAC. So this building that I'm standing in right now, it's called the Kleistron Gallery. Uh, behind me, to my right, you can see uh, one of these big red tubes. That's called a Kleistron. And basically what this thing is, it's a giant microwave. It takes energy from the wall and converts it into microwave energy. It pumps that energy down into the ground where the accelerator is and in the form of microwaves. Electrons coming down the accelerator uh, see this wave and they gain energy basically by surfing the wave. And as they travel down the linear accelerator, they get accelerated toward the speed of light. By the end of it, they're going 99 point nine 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 percent the speed of light that's seven nines following the 99 so again basically as close to the speed of light as you can go for massive particles um, so 
this free electron, that's the only one in the world that we that we have built here, free electron laser, is special because it creates uh, X-rays. So Kat's going to tell you, uh, Kat is our X-ray scientist here, she's going to tell you what we do with those X-rays, but again, this is the only facility in the world with this uh, capability, and scientists from all over the world flock to here to, to do this work, and it makes for really exciting research when they come here. Thanks. Um, so actually, before we uh, take any questions from the class about particle accelerators, will you tell us about how you came to start working on particle accelerators and a little bit about the research that you do? Sure. Um, so when I was uh, an undergraduate, I got the opportunity to work at CERN in Switzerland on the Large Hadron Collider. I was really interested in, in particle physics. And obviously, you know, uh, the LHC has been incredibly successful. They discovered the Higgs boson. But I had this question in my mind, what's the next experiment after the LHC? How are we going to go about discovering more higher energy particles? And right now, the international physics community has not made up their mind on that, on that uh, topic. So the work that I do now is to create the accelerators of the future. So how are we going to pursue uh, the next uh, set of interesting, exciting results in particle physics using Earth-based accelerators? And that's the research that we do here at Slack in my group. Great. Do we have any questions from the classes? Um, we have one. All right. Hold on, he's coming. No problem. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, um, you use magnets, at least right now, to um, focus where the particle is, but how do you know exactly where it is? Because according to the uncertainty principle, you can't know both how fast it's going and where it is at the same time. Great, great question. So uh, to answer the first part of your question, we use special magnets called quadrupole magnets, and they act like lenses. Just like uh, you might focus light with a lens, you can focus a charged uh, particle beam with these quadrupole magnets. So they're special magnets. We have a whole magnet department here, which very precisely designs these magnets and measures the field so that we can do exactly what you described, which is focus them down to small sizes. Your second question is about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We have a special device called a BPM, a beam position monitor, and it measures the centroid position of the electron beam. There are anywhere from uh, 100 million to 100 billion particles in an electron beam. And if you try to measure the position of any one of those particles, you, well, you'd be foiled by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But we don't try and do that. We try and measure the average position of all of the particles. And these BPMs are just electronic sensors that respond to the position of the center of, of this beam that you're sending down. And you can get accurate down to a few microns that way, which is uh, more than good enough for what we're trying to do. But excellent question. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we actually also had a question that was entered online. So this question came from Chris Baer um, from Caracas, Venezuela, who asked, what is the greatest speed uh, greatest speed obtained by particles at the accelerator, and also what are the approximate rest and relativistic masses of the particles that obtain those speeds? All right, so that's also a good question. So as I mentioned, uh, the particles, by the time they get to the end of the accelerator, they're going so close to the speed of light that it takes me a long time to list all the nines following the 99% of the speed of light. Um, Effectively, when we're you know doing our, our calculations, we just assume that the particles are going speed of light. It's just easier to write down the math that way. Um, the particles that we're accelerating are mostly uh, electrons, and uh, their their rest mass we measure in mega electron volts. Uh, so the rest mass of an electron is half a mega electron volt, half of one million electron volt. By the time they get to the end of the accelerator, they've been accelerated to an energy of about 20 billion electron volts, or 20 giga electron volts, GeV. Great. 
All right. Well, so Spencer talked a little bit about uh, what we use our that Linac for these days, Linear Accelerator Four, which is the LCLS X-ray laser. So we have Kat Graves with us, and Kat is a uh, condensed matter physicist uh, who does work at uh, LCLS and also at Synchrotron X-rays. Um, so let's uh, let her tell us a little bit about what she does. Hey, Kat. Oh, are you muted? Oh, there you go. Try All right, again. there we go. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so uh, as uh, Andy said, uh, I am at the LCLS, uh, which is stands for Linac Coherent Light Source, which is really just our acronym for the X-ray laser that we have here at Slack. And I'm standing in the second of six uh, experimental hutches that we have here at the LCLS. And the hutch that I'm standing in is the uh, soft x-ray and material science hutch. But we have lots of hutches that are exploring different things, um, which maybe I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, but what I wanted to first tell you guys is really sort of what's going on between where Spencer just uh, was showing you where the electrons are getting accelerated and where I'm standing here right now. So as Spencer said, uh, we're accelerating the electrons. So they have a ton of energy. They're going really, really fast. And then what we do is we uh, put them into what's called an undulator hall, which is about uh, one to 200 meters upstream, sort of that direction from, from where I'm standing here. And the uh, undulator hall is really just an electron wiggler. The electrons go into the undulator hall, and we, we wiggle them back and forth. And as we're wiggling them, the electrons lose a little bit of energy, and that lost energy is converted into electromagnetic radiation, or light. And the kind of light that we get out, because the electrons are so energetic, is uh, the x-ray light that uh, we use for all of our experiments here. And x-rays are really just that. They're really, really energetic light. Uh, more, uh, the photons basically have more energy per photon than what we get with normal visible light here. So then the x-rays continue to travel down the beam line. Uh, and they come through on the other side of that wall here. And then uh, where I'm standing is where we, uh, like you would um, with a microscope, we focus down the light, uh, sort of measure it, make sure it has all the properties we want. And then we take it into our uh, sample chamber, which is shown here. And so we have a sample in our sample chamber um, uh, inside this uh, uh, metal sort of uh, strange looking thing. And then we have uh, cameras and other detectors that uh, tell us stuff about our, our sample. So then, you know, what, what are the, oh, first thing I wanted to say is all of this stuff is in uh, vacuum. That's why it's sort of in all these metal tubes and everything. In order to keep our x-rays going and really maintain all of them, you know, x-rays would just interact with the particles in, that we have in the air. So we put the x-rays inside these sort of metal tubes and pump out all the air in order to do all, all of our experiments. So what are we then doing with the x-rays? Probably your most familiar experience with x-rays, right, is uh, something going to the doctor's office. If you have something like a broken bone, the doctor can take a picture of, say, your arm, and the x-rays will tell the difference between your bone, where all the calcium is, and just your flesh and muscle that's going around it so you can see whether or not your bone is broken. And we're doing kind of the same thing here, where we're using the x-rays to tell us uh, the positions of atoms and molecules, really, really small things that we've got. Uh, inside our sample chambers. The really cool thing that we're able to do here at the X-ray laser that you can't do really anywhere else at the world or with any other X-ray sources is then while looking at things that are really small like atoms and molecules also watch them react in really really fast ways and the reason we're able to do that is because the X-ray pulses that the laser creates are incredibly short. They're like trillionths of a second. So if you know femtoseconds it's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. We're able to get in time incredibly short pulses of, um, of this x-ray light. And so what you can think of it as if I'm, if I'm dancing in a room or whatever with a strobe light going on, 
the strobe light, if it's really fast, will like stop my motion while I'm dancing. And then I get a picture of what I look like at that position in time. And so we do exactly the same thing, but say I have two molecules that are starting some chemical reaction, and I'm flashing them with this x-ray light, I can see what's happening during the chemical reaction process and how the molecules um, are actually reacting and what's happening during that process. So that's the really cool thing that we're able to do here, study things that are really, really small and that are really, really fast, that are happening on sort of the natural time scales that uh, um, electrons and atoms sort of behave on in nature. That's great. Um, can you tell us also, like Spencer, oh, your microphone's getting a little crazy, but if, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up working there? Um, yeah, it was kind of uh, funny. I came uh, more from a biophysics side uh, in uh, when I was studying in college, uh, and when I got here, I was just really interested in sort of pushing the boundaries for what we can actually measure and what we can actually learn. And uh, I met my my current boss, and I chatted with him, and he was just super excited about all these cool things that we could do with this instrument. This instrument only turned on uh, a couple of years ago, and so uh, to me. It was really exciting to be involved in like the first steps um, in, 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 in a new field. field. Um, so that, so that, that really drew me to this, uh, this, this area. You're, okay, your microphone's getting all, you're sounding a little robo. Uh, uh, robo okay, there. okay. But, so maybe Sorry. I'll Sorry. let you uh, try to fix that. And okay. then okay. we'll come back to you for questions here once we talk to Andrea. That's okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, then, sorry to if you get if somebody had a good question in one of the schools. Sorry, we'll we'll come back. She'll she'll uh, get it figured out here in a second. Um, but before we do that, so um, that's X-ray science, um, and so we found out it's like you could do well, and a lot of places you can do really good research with X-rays. Um, and then, meanwhile, particle accelerators got better and better around the world. Um, and but we decided, you know, where maybe some of the best particle accelerators are are actually up in space. So there's particle accelerators up there that are uh, well beyond anything that we can do here on Earth. And so we also have done some putting particle detectors up in space. Um, so Andrea is going to talk a little bit about astrophysics and uh, what we do there. Andrea. All right, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Yep. So, yeah, welcome to the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope kind of ISOC. Uh, so, unlike Spencer and Kat, uh, my experiment is actually about 340 miles above us. So, unfortunately, I cannot show you live from the LAT, you know, because they cut our budget, so we can't go up into space anymore. Well, no, that's a joke. Um, but I do have a model here that you can see. This is what the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope looks like. And so you can see the this kind of bottom half is the spacecraft. And then there's a top half here that is the instrument I work on. It's called the Large Area Telescope, or the LAT. And we're really not very creative with names. It's large area because it sees almost 20% of the sky at any time. So if you think of a, a telescope that you might look at the moon with, you only can see a very small piece of the sky at any given time. But the LAT here can see a big chunk of it. And so this is great because it gives us, this is a survey instrument, and it gives us a picture of the entire sky every three hours. So it's survey. And um, in my little model here, it has a veto shield, but if I take the veto shield off, you can see what the lat looks like. And there are four by four, so 16 modules. And the top half of the modules are a tracker to tell us where the particle came from, and the bottom half is a calorimeter to tell us how much energy it had. And to give you a sense of what the LAT's actual size is behind me, I have a simulation of the LAT. So this is kind of an electronic simulation of the Large Area Telescope. And so you can see the 4x4 four four modules here. And what you're looking at is um, here is where we can input kind of fake data electronically. So we, we don't actually put this in a beam of particles. We can simulate the particles uh, using computer software. And then we can input them into the software of the space telescope and say, OK, can you handle the particle rates? Because we're getting hit by particles at something around 10 kilohertz. So that is 10,000 particles a second 
are whacking Fermi, and Fermi has to decide very fast, is this an interesting particle or not? Is this a gamma ray or not? Do I want to re record this event out? And it has to do this very, very, very quickly. And whenever we do an update to our software, we test it here at Slack first to make sure that it works. And then we can send it up to the, to the spacecraft and change the software. Um, I do have here behind me on the other side, this is an example of one of the modules. And this is sort of a hollowed out version. And it's upside down. So you can see that our tracker, we have different trays. And in the trays, we have silicon that we use to detect the, uh, the particle's tracks. And we have tungsten. And we use the tungsten to convert the gamma ray to an electron and positron pair. And then we have the calorimeter here, which are just um, cesium iodide logs. And the particle comes in and deposits its energy. It turns its energy into a flash of light. And then we have photo detectors on the end of the logs that say, well, how bright was the light? If it was really, really bright, then that was a very energetic particle. And if it wasn't so bright, then it was a, a less energetic particle. And so by using how much light we collect in the calorimeter, we can determine the energy of the gamma ray. And then, of course, we have our, our readout electronics uh, here. So that's Fermi. Fermi's been operating for just over five years now. Uh, we do have some cool videos on YouTube that you should check out. Um, and there just really is a huge range of science you can do looking at the gamma ray sky. Fermi was the first instrument to look in the um, sort of GeV, uh, 10 GeV, so giga electron volts up to 10 T or up to a TeV electron volts. Um, if you for the higher energies, we have ground-based telescopes that can look at that. And for the lower energies, we had a predecessor, Egret, that looked at that. But Fermi really opened up a new window to the sky. And of course, whenever you look at something new for the first time, you learn a lot. And so gamma rays are being produced in the, like, we call it the non-thermal universe. And so these are the most extreme energetic processes in the universe. So we're talking pulsars, supernovas, gamma ray bursts. Um, and the thing that I work on is uh, looking for a really small signal that might be from dark matter interactions in the universe. Yeah, uh, talk a little bit more about dark matter. And the, you, you, you use Fermi to look for it, and then there's other people at Slack who look for dark matter different ways as well, right? Right, yeah. So when you talk about dark matter uh, searches, which, so just back up a second here. Dark matter, we believe most of the mass of the universe, like 90% of the mass of the universe is in the form of this dark matter. And the way we know this is we can look at galaxies and how the stars are rotating and we say, okay, I can infer how much gravitational glue needs to be in that galaxy to hold it all together. And we say, okay, well the stars are moving around super fast and they're moving around so fast that if the gravity was just coming from the normal matter, it wouldn't be able to hold on to them. They would have flown off into space and they wouldn't be gravitationally bound in the galaxy. And so then we say, OK, well, there's this much gravity. And we know gravity is caused by mass. So there must be this much missing mass that we cannot see through uh, light the way that we normally see things like stars and planets. And so we call that dark matter. Again, we're not very creative with names, but we like to be clear. Um, and additionally, there's this other weird comp stuff that I'm not going to talk too much about called dark energy that makes up a large chunk in the universe as well. And so we like to say about you know, 95% of the universe is unknown. And dark matter is a big piece of that. And we're trying to really understand, is it a particle? And if it is a particle, what kind of properties does it have? And so there's three different ways we can look for particle dark matter. Uh, one is at like the Large Hadron Collider, which we have scientists here at Slack working on, where you smash the protons together and make a, a dark matter particle and detect it in, in the LHC. We also have uh, experiments like the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search, or CDMS which is an experiment Slack scientists here are working on, where you wait for a dark matter particle, which are all around us, to come in, whack in your detector, and make a signal. And so in order to determine that signal, you want your detector to be really quiet. So they usually put them underground to shield all these other particles and noise. And you just sit and wait to see if you ever see a signal in your really quiet detector. Uh, and then what I do is we look for signatures from dark matter interacting in the universe um, and one of those signatures could be MRAs. Awesome. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, let's take some questions from the classes to hear what you guys are wondering about. Anyone have a question? Yeah, we got a question here. Great. Carmen? Sure. How does dark matter interact with regular matter, what we observe, what is generally viewed in the universe? Why is it that dark matter is so hard for us to observe if it can still interact with regular matter? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we sort of know that dark matter can't interact that often because it is, let's say if it interacted via the electromagnetic force, so the force of um, currents and the force of magnets, if it interacted that way, we would have seen it by now. Uh, we're really good at detecting electromagnetic radiation um, with all of our telescopes. And so we say, all right, it's probably not electromagnetic, so it has to be neutral. And then we say, um, OK, well, we know it's interacting via the gravitational force. So gravitational force is one of the four fundamental forces. And then beyond that, it's kind of up in the air. But there is a really promising theory that says that the dark matter is a particle that interacts via the weak force. So the weak force is uh, another one of the fundamental forces that governs nuclear decays. And this does not happen very often. Um, to give you a sense, neutrinos, which are another particle that we know about, uh, interact via the weak force only, um, or mostly. They don't electromagnetically interact. And we have a big detector for neutrinos in Antarctica called Ice Cube. And this thing is huge. And it has to be big because the neutrinos do not interact very much at all. They, we only get maybe a few neutrino events a day in this giant detector. And so we don't really expect the dark matter to interact with us um, beyond its small gravitational force that we know about. And if it does interact via the weak force, then it's probably not going to do too much. I uh, hope that answered your question. Great. Uh, any other questions in the classes? Um, should we, and you could ask uh, Kat as well. I think Kat should be back again. Yeah, hopefully. How does that sound? Yeah, much that, better. Sounds, that sounds much better. Okay, cool. Got a question out there. Any Another question? Questions? Jackson Hole? You guys have lots of Go ahead, ask another one. Uh, you, you talked about specifically with x-rays looking at positrons and electrons. And Kat talked about using protons to see dark matter. Uh, or, sorry, Andrea talked about uh, seeing protons to see dark matter. Why is it that you guys are looking at electrons uh, and positrons mainly with the oh. accelerator? So that's uh, probably, is that for, is that catch for cat? Yeah. I think that's for me, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're, we're using different kinds of light. So using the x-rays to look at uh, materials, sort of uh, kind of the materials that go in your computer, uh, to look at next generation materials for new technologies, uh, to look at atoms and molecules, proteins that are like in your body. And so one of the cool things about x-rays uh, and why we use x-rays to study a lot of these material systems or just, you know, the atoms that you have in your periodic table uh, is a, a couple of reasons. The x-rays are really energetic, so you can see really, really small things. So I can see really the distance between two atoms um, and see things on that, that really tiny length scale. Uh, the second uh, reason is that the energy that x-rays have is really good at picking out um, sort of the differences between the different elements uh, that we have just naturally in our world. So I can tune the energy of the x-rays to be able to tell me, say if I have a molecule, to be able to tell me what the carbon atoms are doing in that molecule and ignore the oxygen atoms or the nitrogen atoms. And so that's the other really handy thing that we can do with x-rays and why we use them uh, to study uh, materials and biological systems is that we can use the tune the energy of the x-rays to pick out exactly what element we want to look at. Great. Um, I, we had a question actually entered online as well about how your x-rays compare to a doctor's office x-rays. Okay. Um, so uh, the x-rays that we have here compared to doctor x-rays for one, uh, the x-ray light that we have here is billions and billions of times brighter. Uh, so actually, you know, when you go in the doctor's office, they put a lead um, sort of apron over your chest, right, and then sort of take the picture of whatever they want to look at. 
in here, our x-rays are so powerful that I can't actually be in this room during the experiment. I have to be across the hall in sort of uh, a control room, and we have a big lead door that goes down and shuts the experiment. Like, that's how bright our x-rays are. We just have um, billions and billions uh, uh, more intensity than you would have at a doctor's office. And the other difference is uh, that pulse length that I talked about earlier. In the doctor's office, you kind of have a steady stream of x-rays, almost like from a light bulb. Um, whereas what we have here is, again, something more like a laser. We get a really fast, um, intense pulse of x-rays. And that's what allows us to do um, kind of make movies of things or see how things are uh, evolving on uh, long time scales. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, so I actually didn't realize that we're running a lot of time because we have the delay. Do you, the classes need to run, um, or do you want to ask any last questions? Um, Andy, we've got one more question, and we have about five minutes before we need to go. Okay. We may, um, for anyone watching online, we may, there's a, been a few questions asked through the app, so we'll keep um, answering a few questions, but you schools, you guys are welcome to um, log out whenever, when you guys have to go to class. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Here's our yes. question. Thank you, guys. Hi. Um, will you explain the role of pulsars in the universe? I think this is for Andrea. Yeah. All right, so pulsars. Uh, pulsars are very interesting. They're very uh, compact objects, so neutron stars that have jets coming out of the poles. And these things are spinning really fast. I mean, like once, it takes them maybe 30 milliseconds to go around once. And these are big, big objects. Um, imagine taking the sun and compacting it down to maybe the size of San Francisco, the city. Um, and so as these things are spinning, they're going, as the beam rotates around, it's going to point at us and then away from us, then at us and away from us. And so that means it's going to pulse, and it's going to pulse in a very periodic way. Um, and so something that we, we knew about pulsars, we can see them in radio waves, which are uh, lower energy electromagnetic radiation. And something great that Fermi's discovered is we've seen some pulsars that maybe only are pulsing in gamma rays, but not radio. That's weird. Um, another thing is we can see that some of the pulses in gamma rays are out of sync with the pulses in radio waves. And so then you ask, well, so are there two jets? Or like, what's going on? And it seems like the, the pulses that make the gamma ray radiation are very very complicated electromagnetic um, forces in this really dense, extreme environment. And so this is something that we're still studying to try to understand. Um, maybe a pulsar that you might have heard of is called Vela. Uh, it's in the galactic plane. It's one of our big calibration sources for the Fermi Large Area Telescope. Um, and that's kind of maybe one that I'm most familiar with. But yeah, that one, I think, is the 30 millisecond period. Um, did that answer your question? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson's class, do you guys have any questions? or? Uh, no, I think we're good, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to keep, we'll go through some of the questions that we have online, but um, I understand if you guys have to run. So. I think we're going to keep listening. Oh, we great. have to go to class, so thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone else, for contributing. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And you guys can watch the end online after. Bye. You'll want to see how it ends. Bye -bye. We will in our next class. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so we had a few questions that were entered online. So first, uh, I thought one good one here was um, if a young person wanted to work in, in one of your fields, so let's say, uh, let's, let's go to CAT. Or let's maybe we can each say quickly, what classes or majors would you recommend? So we'll start with Kat. Um, OK, that's a great question. Uh, physics is really good, uh, <laughs> kind of obviously. Uh, it's, it's, it's shocking how much you kind of learn on the job. Um, you can really uh, come from a bunch of different backgrounds. The people that I work with, some people are chemists, so they majored in chemistry. Some people are physicists. Some people went to more engineering schools, so they really have more of an engineering background. Um, so any, any of these kinds of uh, fields, or even, even biology, um, where it's really just the, the kind of questions that you want to ask um, later in life will kind of uh, set set you on your background path. And then a lot of it you really just learn. It's like an apprenticeship 
as you go on. Graduate school is really an apprenticeship, and you, you pick up a lot of stuff uh, when you're actually uh, in, in grad school. So kind of a general science background, uh, basic math, you know, calculus, um, but yeah. Anybody want to add to that? Any of the other scientists? Yeah, sure. Um, so a lot of the work that, that I do, yeah, besides physics, um, math classes, maybe chemistry, um, if you go to college uh, as you're getting your bachelor's, become involved in research right away. Because like Kat was saying, a lot of what you learn, you learn on the job. And I almost, I, the teachers are going to not be happy, but I almost never use what I formally learned in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. I use what um, I've just sort of picked up as I do things. And uh, I guess another class that would be good if you were interested in like my sort of field is a computer programming class. I do a lot of code writing, uh, specifically in like Python and C. Uh, there's a particle physics software called Root that like all particle physicists use. So if you're going to be a particle physicist, you got to learn Root. And it's kind of a pain, so it's good to start early. And I'm sure every field has its own uh, software scripting language that they're specialized in. So you'll want to take that class, too. Awesome. Um, I have a question that's for uh, Spencer. Uh, how is the particle accelerator made? Well, it's actually several questions, so you have to decide how you want to answer. But uh, how is the particle accelerator made? What materials were used to build it? Uh, how will the particle accelerator help build a better society for humans, and can it help find cures for diseases? So, uh, again, that's just generally like how was it built, and then uh, how can it benefit society um, beyond just you know the idea of I guess doing basic research? Um. Okay, um, I have a uh, a chunk of the accelerator here in my hand. Let's see, can yeah. Cool. Okay, great. So um, it's made out of copper. When it was first made in the 60s and 70s, it was a really shiny piece of copper. Anyway, um, uh, as you can see, uh, inside there are these grooves. So this, this piece of accelerator has been cut away. This is a, a, there's a slice taken out of it. And uh, what these grooves do, it helps uh, take this microwave energy and direct it in such a way that the electrons can gain energy from the microwave as they... Uh, as they propagate through this cavity. So this device is called an RF cavity. And RF stands for radio frequency. Um, so uh, these are very precisely machined. Um, not many companies in the world make these, but there is one here in Palo Alto called Varian. Uh, Varian is a company founded by two of the original accelerator physicists, and they make medical accelerators. So these are machines that, if you go to the doctor's office and you need an x-ray, um, they have uh, x-ray machines, or they have machines for um, cancer treatment. So uh, God forbid you have cancer, but it's treatable with radiation therapy. They make medical Linux, which are small linear accelerators made out of the exact thing that I just showed you. And they can direct uh, radiation into a tumor very precisely with amazing accuracy. And in fact, some of the research that's happen actually happening at SLAC uh, is based on that idea with either electron beams or gamma ray beams. Um, and so, you know, our hope is that that kind of technology, you know, helps to cure cancer in people, helps to improve the lives of people. Um, but we also partner with the medical school here for all sorts of diagnostic techniques. So accelerators can actually be used to diagnose uh, cancers or any other problem and kind of look through you and see is there a problem there. Great. Um, we have a, I have another um, question that's specifically to you while we have you. Um, how uh, has your experiment in oh. plasma acceleration, are you seeing uh, promising results? Yeah, so we had uh, some great results last summer uh, to be published soon. Um, the, uh, the, this experiment that I work on called plasma weight field acceleration, we feel that this might be the future of accelerators. So instead of using this copper structure that I just showed you to accelerate electrons, we use a plasma. So a plasma, you, you may know, that's like what the sun is. It's it just this uh, gas where the electrons have been ripped off of the atoms. So you've got electrons and ions. 
and it has electromagnetic properties because the electrons are charged and the ions are charged. Um, the fields, the electromagnetic fields that you can generate in a plasma are thousands of times stronger than the fields that you can gener generate in RF cavity. If you were to try and generate really large fields in the structure that I showed you, you would destroy the, the structure, you'd destroy the structure and create a plasma. So what we said was, well, let's just start with the plasma. Let's not worry about the structure at all. And what we were able to demonstrate uh, this summer was that we were able to do 10,000 times better, 10,000 times higher accelerating gradient than what we could achieve in the slack accelerating cavity. So that potentially leads to the colliders of the future that uh, collide particles not at a trillion electron volts, a TeV, but maybe at a quadrillion electron volts, a PeV. Great. Um, were there any other questions from the classes? Okay. Or from Hutchinson's no. class? No, we're good, thank you. Okay. Um, then um, someone did ask quickly the question about uh, whether we had high school uh, interns or summer jobs for students. So um, you can check our website. There's a few different opportunities for that. But um, you heard some good ideas about the classes to take if you're interested in getting those. Um, there's just a few, and I think they're pretty competitive. So um, go check those out, though. Um, and then otherwise, uh, I think we're running out of time. So I just wanted to quickly thank the high schools for joining us. I wanted to thank Spencer and Kat and Andrea for taking time out of their day to uh, show us their labs and show us what they talk to us about what they do. I want to thank Google Plus Connected Classrooms for uh, working with us to set this up. Um, if you guys like this one, there was one by the Jefferson, Jefferson Lab and by Argonne National Lab, um, who both have done little field trips too, so you can find those on their YouTube, uh, YouTubes, YouTube. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, February, uh, the Department of Energy is going to be talking a lot about STEM as we do science poll. Um, so hopefully some of you guys are uh, involved in that. Those are, so keep an eye out for those kind of things. Otherwise, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate you, you taking the time so out to be here with us. And we will talk to you guys later. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.